We didn't realize it at the time, but the storm had blown us a mile south of the harbor when we hit this breaker zone. And these are big breakers. We actually drove right off of one. And boom, catapulted me into the ocean. It's absolutely dark. It's turbulent. I'm being tossed and tumbled like a rag doll. It was probably one of the most ferocious and vicious moments in my life. You can only hold your breath so long. And it isn't long that you try to breathe. And I drown. I drown. But there's this pervasive feeling that I'm not alone. That there's something greater there. I'm David Bennett. I grew up in central New York as a child. My mom was a single mother when it wasn't popular to be a single mother. So she kind of would ship me around from one family to the next. She would pay them $5 a week for them to care for me, to house me, send me to school, stuff like that. She thought she was doing the best thing for me. Unfortunately, a lot of these families, I was just an extra kid in the house, you know, and, um, and I didn't really belong in the house. And kids pick up on that. Kids perceive when they're wanted and when they're not wanted. And so I never, ever really felt like I was a part of any of these families that I was put into. It was a very dysfunctional first seven years of my life. It taught me to kind of be very independent and self-reliant um, as a, just as a young boy. And then at seven to 14, I was placed with a family that was a little more grounded, a little more centered. But then my mom pulled me out of that family because she now wanted to be my mother. And at 14, I didn't know really who this woman was um, or my new stepfather at the time. And they had a habit of arguing a lot. So I spent a lot of that time escaping. I went into the service because I really couldn't afford college on my own. So I went into the service to be able to get money for college and to go into engineering school. And so I became a mechanical engineer in the Navy, and I did well. I was able to be productive and to move forward. But I had that philosophy of, I'm going to cut my swath through life. And so I was very narrow focused. I really didn't care what other people thought. Um, I had my sense of direction. I was going to go there. If you got in my way, I would go right through you. Um, I, you know, so it was a very, uh, I wasn't a very nice young man in those days. And then when I got out of the service, I became a commercial diver because that was one of the things that I really loved. I found diving when I was younger, I, I was scuba diving. And so I wanted to combine the engineering with diving. And so I became a commercial diver and eventually became the chief engineer of the research vessel Aloha. I was in charge of just about anything that moved or was mechanical on that ship. That was my dream job. There's no rule book for the work that we were doing, you know, and as the chief engineer, every job created new challenges and my soul fed on that. Commercial diving in the 80s was incredibly dangerous. In fact, we couldn't get personal life insurance because the survivability of commercial diving back in those days was, was not too great. And I have many friends that, um, you know, had accidents, you know, they became embolized or they, you know, lost their hearing and things like that. It was very arduous, tough, dangerous work. In 1983, off the California coast, we were evaluating a new ROV, a new remote operated summary. Suddenly we saw that, you know, there was a storm coming up and we thought, oh, well, let's beat it back to the harbor before it gets too bad because at the mouth of the harbor, Many times the breakwater gets really rough right there. We didn't beat the storm. The storm overtook us and we had 25 to 30 foot breakers at the breakwater to the harbor. Running the ship is very expensive on a day-to-day -day basis. And so they wanted to relieve that crew. The captain and the design engineers decided that we would put a small boat in the water. It was a rubber Zodiac which we used to retrieve submarines in heavy seas. And we we're really confident in its abilities. 
the captain this night decided that I would go. I'm the chief engineer. Normally, I do not go on the small boats because I'm in charge of the ship. But because we were just evaluating a submarine, we weren't on a full-blown job, we only had a small deck crew. And so the crew that we had were not familiar with the harbor. So the captain thought, because I'm third officer, I knew the harbor well, that I should go on this trip. We actually went down to the bosun's locker that night and got out life vests. And the life vests had been in that bosun's locker so long, they were just encrusted with dirt and debris. And we had to like beat the dirt off them just with, you know, to be able to put them on. So we had these big giant pillows wrapped around us, you know, these big orange pillows. And we jumped in the Zodiac and we started heading in. We had taken a Baron with the radars, so we knew harbor and we could see the shoreline was lit up, but we had this storm over us. So it was really dark, you know, and you could just see the the light of the horizon ahead of you. And so we were trying to maintain a visual on the harbor buoy. But you got to realize that when you're in these these huge rollers that, you know, we would go up on top of a crest, take a bearing on the harbor buoy, and then run down the swell and up on top of the next one, do it all over again. It wasn't very long before we'd lost track of the harbor buoy. We didn't realize it at the time, but the storm had blown us, you know, a mile south of the harbor, and we were a, still a mile offshore when we hit this breaker zone. And these are big breakers. And we actually drove right off of one and boom, landed in the ocean. And that's when the next one was right above us, came right down on top of us. And, and when it hit our boat, it folded the Zodiac in half, just like a peanut butter sandwich. And I was in the bow, it catapulted me into the ocean. I'm a trained commercial diver. I mean, I'm not gonna panic because I've spent lots of time in the ocean, but this is at nighttime. There's no street lights. It's absolutely dark. It's turbulent. I'm being tossed and tumbled like a rag doll. It was, uh, it was probably one of the most ferocious and vicious moments in my life because I had absolutely no control and had totally lost my orientation as to what was up and what was down. You can only hold your breath so long. Eventually, oxygen deprivation starts to occur you start to feel this euphoria. And that euphoria is, it, it kind of overwhelms your senses uh, to the point where you're not yourself and, and you believe that you can breathe. And it isn't long that you try to breathe and I drown, I drown. I found myself in this absolute darkness. And you got to realize I was in this ocean that was roiling, you know, this, you know, you can't imagine the amount of noise that an ocean makes when it's, when it's, you know, pounding those waves. And so suddenly it's quiet and it's peaceful. I'm not being tumbled and tossed anymore. I'm not cold anymore. I'm comfortable. But there's this pervasive feeling that I'm not alone that there's something greater there. You know, they teach us about oxygen deprivation. They teach us, they take us pretty far into the euphoria, you know, but this is way past anything I'd ever experienced. So I'm like curious, what is this? You know, I just was in the most violent episode of my life and now I'm in this peace and this quiet. And then I saw just this tiny little pinprick of light and it draws your attention, you know, suddenly there's this light. And I started looking at it and it felt like it was coming toward me. I was moving toward it. And as I got closer and closer to the light, I noticed that it was like millions upon millions of fragments of light. And they were all interacting with each other. They were, if you've ever seen a school of sardines or, or something like that, where they all swim in unison, it's like they have one mind. These fragments of light were like that, but they were infinite. At this point, I'm like, whoa, you know, who am I? What am I? You know, that, those types of questions. And I looked down and, and, and it was like my body was becoming one of these fragments of light. 
I started feeling these waves, waves of, of just love. It was like I was being wrapped in this warm blanket of love. It was incredible. Here, we tend to add a lot of conditions to our love. Okay, um, you know, I'll love you and I expect you to love me back. And you know that's conditional love. But this love is unconditional. And it's just, it pervades everything to the point that, that it feels like love is the core element that everything is built upon. As I got closer, three fragments broke away and they were welcoming me home. And I recognized them as family. Not so much family that I'd lived in this life, but more of a, a greater family that are always with me. And, and eventually a dozen of them came and they were welcoming me home. They communicated to me that we were going deeper into the light. We went into this area that to me felt very spherical, very round. And we went inside it and I started to relive my life. It's more than just a review. It's, it's a re-experiencing of your life. And I got to see it from not only my perspective, but everyone I'd ever interacted with. It was like my consciousness had fragmented into these multiple streams of consciousness, and I was looking at it and living my life from all these different perspectives. So every time that I would do something, I got to feel how it affected someone. And I was just in awe of all of it, but I was also, I realized that not only was I experiencing it this way, but this all of this family that I had met, I call them my soul family, they were experiencing it with me. And um, like I said, I was kind of a brash young man, you know, and I'd done some things that I wasn't too proud of. And so when it came to some of those elements in my life review, I wasn't real pleased. I, you know, I, was, I was ashamed that they had to experience this because they were living at a higher level of consciousness than I'd ever known existed. And so for them to have to experience this, but they didn't. They were just loving me and supporting me through this entire review. Everything in the life review was crystal clear. And so it was awe-inspiring, but also incredibly humbling to see how much we affect the world around us. But eventually I reached a point where I had died, but we kept, it kept going this next element was not quite as clear. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I was looking into my own future. What I saw there was like this corridor, this path ahead of me. But in the periphery, there was a lot that was available to me that, you know, I, I got the feeling that, well, if I wanted to, I could go this way or I could go that way. And it was a little disorienting. Because again, you didn't have all this focus like you did in the life review, but, but my family just loved me. They supported me. They buoyed me up. And eventually I reached a point where the light itself, now this enormous, infinite light spoke in unison and it said, this is not your time. You must return. And I said, no way. Mm -mm. Ah, ah, ah. I've got a family that I didn't know existed that loves me and, and is supporting me. Um, I know that body is, is back there and it's broken. And I don't mean to sound crass, but it just looked like cold meat to me. And I just, I had no desire to go back to that body. And so I argued with what I perceived as God. I argued didn't do me much good because you can see I'm here. But I, I did. I argued with, and, and the voice came back and it said one more time, it said, you must return. You have a purpose. And that word purpose just resonated through my being. When we've gone beyond this life into the next realm, we live with this expansive consciousness that is so much greater than what we have available to us here in this physical life. And so with that expansive consciousness, that word purpose, I understood it. It was simple. It was efficient. I knew exactly what it was. And with that, there's no choice. You just come to accept it. 
And with that acceptance, I found myself outside my body. The original three light beings who had greeted me were with me. And we were observing my body in the ocean as it was being tumbled and tossed. My body came close to some of the wreckage of the Zodiac, and the bow line had wrapped itself around this arm and was tapping me on the chest. And I was mesmerized by this. I was watching this outside my body, and I'm thinking, how is the enormity of me going to fit in there? And so another wave hit the Zodiac. And when it did, the Zodiac had a little bit of air left in one of the pontoons and it popped up. And when it did, it cinched that line around my arm and it pulled my arm up, actually dislocated my shoulder and thumb. And I'm watching it. I'm not feeling it, but I'm watching it happen. And it pulled my body up to the surface. And so myself and my my three soul family members, we rose up with it and we were observing this as my body got tangled up in the wreckage of this zodiac. And another series of waves hit it. And when it did, it was pounding my body up against the zodiac. And some of that salt water got pushed out of my lungs. And my family gave me a gentle push. And I came back into my body. I have to say, dying is hard, but coming back to life is even more difficult because you just had this expansive moment and now you're back in this physicalness that feels heavy and constrictive. It was incredibly hard to be back in this body. And of course, I'm still getting rid of salt water. And I hear my mates, they're the real heroes of this story because they had stayed on station while I had drowned and came back to life, and they were searching for me. And one of them had held on to a flashlight, and they were sweeping the surface and trying to find me. And I tried to respond because they were calling out to me, but I tried to respond, but all I could, you know, when, you, when you've when you breathed in salt water, your, your larynx is really irritated, but they spotted me and they came over and we all rallied around that that wreckage. And once we were all accounted for, we all started heading in. You know, we still had that mile to swim. When we hit the beach, because I had a dislocated shoulder and thumb, one of the crew put a foot here and a foot here and pulled back and popped my shoulder back in. And I pounded my thumb until I got it back in place. But boy, I felt like a Mack truck had run me over. Some of my buddies that were in that ocean with me were saying, you know, Dave, We were looking for you for a long time. You can't hold your breath that long. What happened? And I said, oh, Neptune spit me back. You know, I'd I'd covered up. I just covered up for it. In the world I lived in, commercial diving was incredibly dangerous. And death was a taboo subject. And so we didn't uh, didn't talk about death. So I didn't feel like I could share it with my mates. I didn't feel like I could share it with my family. And so I just kind of... I I tried to put it away and I tried to just live with what I could. It scared me. It frightened me. The experience, um, and that's hard to say for a macho diver guy that I was at the time, but it, it, it really rattled me because, um, it, I didn't have any foundation for this experience. And so I was trying, I was grasping how to deal with it. And I found that if I just took the elements that I was comfortable with, and then I would just shove the rest of it away, kind of. And the the elements that I was comfortable with was in that life review, you know, I was in my mid-20s, and suddenly I saw who I was. I saw, boy, I've got a lot of things to work on, but I could accept this is who I am right here, right now, and I can work on myself to be better. The rest of it, speaking to God, arguing with God, meeting a soul family. I tried to bury it. I tried to bury it. I like to say that I took it, put it in a box, wrapped it up with duct tape because divers love duct tape and and wrote on it with a big old marker, you know, do not touch and shoved it as far back in my mind as I possibly could and, and tried to go on with my life. When I came back, there were two questions. 
purpose, 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 purpose. What was that purpose that I was told I had? Because as I came back into life, it, it just kind of like evaporated. It was like I had it. I, un I knew what that purpose was, but then it slowly dissolved away and I no longer understood the purpose. But the other thing that I could hold on to was the love. And not only myself, but many experiencers, after experiencing that love, you go looking for it. I want that in my life. I want that in my physical life because I hadn't felt that kind of love. The experiences I had with love were really conditional. And, um, and so to suddenly have this unconditional, all pervasive love that is attached to everything and is the root of everything, you start looking for it. You start, you know, where can I find that? How can I bring that back into my life? It can be a trap, actually, because you can become so involved with trying to find that that you put your life aside and, and, and just in the search to try to bring that back into your life. Or it creates a longing, a desire to go back into that. And so, you know, many times experiencers are, are very depressed afterwards because that love was so prominent. They want it in their life, but they can't find it. And so they long. I long to go back. And I'll tell you, when it's my time to return, I will welcome the return. But I understand the importance of living a full and rich life, and I would never do anything to jeopardize that. The experience itself has this element of hyper-reality, and it feels more real. And so that gives you that feeling of being home because that feels more real than this. This life feels like a dream, it feels like I'm walking in a dream because I'm confined in this body with limited mental ability. And I long to go back home where I have my totality of who I am. Um, I have a theory that, um, that when we're in this body, we bring with us just a percentage of our light. We bring just a small part of our light with us. But when we're released from the confines of this body, we're reintegrated with the totality of our being with the wholeness of who we really are. There are times when we're having a spiritual experience that a larger percentage of it is available to us, but then, you know, we go about our normal day, and so we're only utilizing a small percent of our light, of our greater being. I was working as the manager of dialysis programs at St. Joseph's Hospital in Syracuse, New York, and I started having problems with my back, but I didn't think anything of it, and I was starting to have numbness in my arm and stuff like that, and I thought it was carpal tunnel because we were doing a lot more keyboarding and, and things like that, so um, I kind of dismissed it. And, but then all of a sudden, one day in the office, it was like my back exploded. And I was scheduled to have a meeting with one of the vice presidents and directors. And I walked in, I said, I'm in an incredible pain. I'm going to go up to the ED, the emergency department, and present myself. And while in the exam room, the nurse came in. And this is a moment when suddenly I recognized it from my life review. It was like deja vu on steroids. And she's got tears in her eyes. And I know, I know this moment. I know this moment. And, and so the doctor comes in and he's kind of hemming and hawing, you know, he's like, well, David, you know, I have to tell you, you know, and he was talking about the masses on my lung and, and this and that. And the other thing, I let him sweat. I kind of let him sweat because I really was kind of playing with the moment to see, is this going to play out like exactly like I know it's going to play out? And, and it did. It worked out exactly the way I had experienced it in the light. I had stage four lung and bone cancer. The, uh, it started out in my lungs and it metastasized into my spine, ate two and a half bones of my thoracic and my spine had collapsed. They did additional tests. They found I had lesions in my hip, my brains and my kidneys. They, you know, gave me morphine and Percocet to make me comfortable. And they were going to send me home and, and they told me to get my affairs in order. I had one 
doctor that consulted and, and he said, yeah, you know, you've got six to eight weeks. But I said, no, because I had seen in my near-death experience that I was going to have cancer, but I also saw I was going to live beyond the cancer and that there was purpose attached to it. And so I felt that it was necessary, and this sounds a little odd, but I, w I used a lot of gratitude. This is when I actually started a lot of my gratitude practice. I used gratitude for going through the suffering that I was going through. And a lot of people thought that was nuts, but it's like, you know, if you're going to be grateful, you've got to be grateful for all of life. When you're in gratitude, you reach a level of sincerity that is akin with the divine. In pure gratitude, where you're grateful for everything in your life, you reach that point of stillness so that it allows you to be able to see that pathway forward. And that, I was using that as my guidance. And so I was using gratitude as kind of an anchor to help me. And because I was assistant director at the hospital, I was able to put together a healthcare team to be able to treat it. And by this time, I have a pretty strong grasp on my spiritual connection. I use that to look at holistic approaches. How can I balance off the traditional with holistic approaches? And within six months, um, we were cancer-free. Life itself is this amazing adventure that I never realized before. The near-death experience, and especially in the life review, you got to see how, even though only a part of our light is with us, we're still integral in the experience of oneness, the experience of God. While we're here, we have a, an incredible opportunity, actually a, a bit of a responsibility, to try to be the best person that we possibly can be. And all the avenues that that leads us into is amazing. A lot of times, you know, we look at our life with hindsight, okay, and we see, wow, you know, I did that. And even though that was a lot of suffering there, on the backside of it, I learned this and I benefited by that, you know. So even though life gets hard, a lot of times we're co-creating with everyone else. And so, yeah, I long to go back to the light where it's expansive. But you know what? The work that we're doing here is just as important. It's just as meaningful. Hi, my name's Adam Tapp, and I had a near-death experience February 28th, 2018, where I was electrocuted to death, and I was dead for around 11 and a half minutes before being resuscitated, and this is my story. So I know I've been a paramedic for 20 years now, and I do a lot of woodworking, which I find cathartic, and it's a form of, I guess, emotional release to some extent. And I was doing sort of a technique of wood etching called a Lichtenberg device, where you take a microwave transformer and basically strip every possible safety feature from it and hook it up to a wall, 110 volts AC, and it basically turns it into 12,000 volts DC. And this highly dangerous machine <laughs> basically etches these interesting coral patterns into wood. And so I was with a good friend of mine and we had had a beer and we were sitting by my shop and we were etching this piece of wood. And conveniently enough, he had taken a high voltage safety course about two weeks before, which is profoundly convenient for a number of different reasons. And I remember I was talking to him and I was moving the electrodes one by one and it just arced into my hand. And it was just this snap from reality. It was almost overwhelming. It was like this intense, intense level of absolute pain, like every single cell in my body was being pulled into pieces. And it was overwhelming to a point where I didn't understand what was happening. It was almost as if everything had shut down and it was just everything in my vision was these vertical cylinders that were sort of this iridescent green that went up and down forever. I remember trying to focus a thought amongst the energy and i think it was like I'm, I'm being electrocuted and then i think i thought i'm falling and i felt like i was falling for ages and then it was just like waking up from a nap someplace that i'd always been 
it was this perfect inky blackness. It was almost like deep space where it was like there's there lights in the distance, like these twinkling stars to some extent, but it was just this perfect blackness. It was like I was seen spherically from a single point outwards. Like I had just become a single point of awareness. And I wasn't Adam, I wasn't dead, I wasn't anything. I was just perfect, like absolute contentment. And I was just in this space for time. Like there, there was no sense of consistency with anything. It was just simply existing as awareness. And then I felt sort of this frequency start washing over me. And it was like, a, whoa, whoa, whoa. it was like this fractal patterns. And it was like gasoline on water, this rainbow effect that was iridescent to some extent. And it was just this juxtaposition of thoughts and feelings and emotions. And I felt myself sort of being pulled into pieces and deposited into everything. It was like basically becoming fabric of the universe. And it was absolutely perfect. Like there was no fear and there was nothing. This was just the natural progression of what every single one of us is going to do, which is back to the source, back to this infinite consciousness or infinite complexity. And then all of a sudden I started being electrocuted again. And at the time I didn't understand what was happening, but in hindsight, it was me being defibrillated. I was defibrillated twice. I was in a, a ventricle fibrillation arrhythmia, which is basically the heart spasming. And so I was defibrillated and the defibrillation takes 0.5 seconds, but this was, this was like minutes, if I can even say that, of being electrocuted again. And then all of a sudden it stopped. And now I'm aware that I'm Adam, that I'm dead, that I should have been electrocuted. And now I'm in this void of just a being. And it was a really long time that I was just there, maybe coming to terms with who and what I was and myself and my place in the universe. And I started being electrocuted again, which again was the second fibrillation. And I remember myself being pulled perhaps out or some variation of that. And then I think I maybe at one point acknowledged the smell of burnt flesh, which would have been my hands. My finger was burned off and I had third degree burns all over this hand. And I was in a coma for about eight hours, which was fine for me, but problematic for everyone else who thought I was brain dead. And, you know, I remember waking up in the ICU when I was innovated tube into my lungs and I had an interosseous needle drilled into my shoulder bone. Like my first thought was, how long has it been? And I remember like sort of being able to write something down. My hands were all bandaged and you know, they said it's like eight hours or something. And it blew my mind. Like I, if someone had told me it had been five years or a decade, I, I would have been completely on point with that. But what was unique about the experience is after I was extubated and, you know, hugs from everyone and whatnot, I remember like looking at myself and I could smell myself and not body odor in the sense of need to put deodorant on, but my natural pheromonal smell that we all have because we're primates. We just go to great lengths to hide it. But I was so hyper aware of my smell and the texture of my skin. And I felt so deeply that I just got downgraded from this Cray supercomputer to this Commodore 2000, this pixelated screen. And that stuck with me for a long time. Like it was was like months of just feeling this way and i remember saying to my wife like this isn't real like this isn't real and i was a little alarmed by that and but eventually it just came back to the acceptance of being in my body and being in this space but you know i, I was left with this overwhelming sense that this is just a stage this is simply an evolution of consciousness this is simply transient where we exist right now and you know there wasn't any anthropomorphic figures or people in robes. It was just simply going back to the source of everything, which is this infinite consciousness that permeates everything. You know, simply the space between subatomic particles is consciousness. And, you know, I didn't want to read anything about other people's near death experiences, but I didn't want it to change my interpretation of what had happened to me. But, you know, I had the traditional photophobia where I was going on Corey Hart wearing sunglasses at all times of day. Like it was even the light inside a house, which is almost be blinding to me. And another interesting thing, too, is that the burns on my hands actually accelerated healing. I was told I would need skin grafts. And in a very short period of time, everything revascularized and started healing, which was interesting. I can't necessarily say that that's a consistency amongst people with NDEs, but it was very much this process of getting used to what I have to call a monkey suit now, because it very much is. It's, it's a very, it's a limitating filter in which I currently exist in, the limitations of my biology. But at the same time, it's so deeply beautiful that I can 
simply just experience emotions and feelings. But the one thing that I took from all of this was in that place, when I was devoid of a body, I was very, very highly aware of the amount of anxiety, the amount of weird emotions that riff and sift through us on any, any specific moment, the biological mechanisms, the hormones that make us do things. It was a state of absolute tranquility. And it was, again, it was one of those things when I was back in my body of just feeling these emotions come up and not necessarily knowing what to do with them because it had seemed that I had just completely disconnected from everything that is this biological mechanism of this atom. And now was back into this fold. You know, I started doing psychedelics subsequently afterwards, and I feel that the very nature of death experiences is so integrally related to these psychedelic compounds and dimethyltryptamine in our bodies and in our brains responsible for dreaming and death. And I feel that the experience itself has made me so deeply spiritual. You know, I think I was superficially spiritual before, in the sense that we just trivially use the word, you know, without necessarily understanding the deeper meaning behind it. But it's almost like experiencing infinite consciousness and becoming part of it and then coming back to this and still having that awareness. The awareness that we're just part of something that is so profoundly complicated, so infinitely perfect. So I think something to take away from all of this or something that I've noticed has changed in me and my personality is my ability to just simply appreciate a moment as opposed to applying meaning to everything or plans or language is just simply able to be in a space and appreciate what's going on. You know, I, I noticed that with my daughter a lot, just simply being in a space and enjoying every moment of it. And, you know, one thing I also want to mention in this is the similarities to psychedelic experiences and being dead. You know, one could arguably suggest that my death experience was just an endogenous dimethyltryptamine release, which is commonly referred to as NNDMT. And subsequent psychedelic experiences have been death. They've been versions of this. They've arguably been more profound than death actually was. And I think that at the end of the day, the one thing that I would say to someone if they asked me what I took from this or the advice associated with it, is that death is quite possibly the most natural thing that happens. Being dead was easy, it was perfect, it was beautiful. You know, it's being alive that's difficult and hard. And I think that death in itself is just simply a transition. It's becoming infinite, it's becoming the fabric of the universe. It's being perfect. You know, one could argue that we're all perfect already, but we just refuse to acknowledge that. And being death was just absolute perfection. And I think that, you know, the common fear that we all have is our mortality. And it's understandable. It's genetically motivated. You know, if we didn't have a fear of death, we wouldn't be a species that we are today. But again, death just was simply perfection. It was becoming everything. And it was perfect. And I think that it's made me spiritual in a sense you know i think before i was spiritual but superficially whereas now it seems that spirituality has taken on a very significant depth in me where i viscerally know what we all are and where we're all going and that does alleviate a lot of the fear that we all exist with on a day-to-day -day basis and yeah i guess to summarize everything i have was being dead was the state of absolute perfection. I walked around the front of the building where there was a payphone attached. What I hadn't realized was that a storm cloud had blown up over the lake. And so we're right next to the lake. So I walk over and I'm going to call my mom and I put in the code and the phone and I'm trying to get her on the payphone and I heard a huge crack. And this big flash of light came out of the phone and it hit me right in the face and just threw me back like a rag doll. I fully expected that when you died, something would happen to tell you, you know, bells, whistles, who knows what. But there wasn't. It was just a very natural progression of I was in this state 
this second and the next second, I was someplace else. I went from being in a physical form to being in a spiritual form. My name is Anthony David Sicoria. I grew up in Kingston, New York. I was there for my first 18 years. I had gotten into some trouble my last year in high school, stupid things that teenagers do. My high school football coach had gone to the Citadel, which was a military school in South Carolina. He put a bug in my father's ear that I needed to go to the Citadel because I needed some mild corrections. And so my, I remember my father saying, well, you can go to any school you want to, but if you don't go to the Citadel, don't come home. I thought, okay, <laughs> that makes it pretty simple choice. So I went to the Citadel and I uh, played football there and got my education in biology. When I was there, my last year, I had the honor of working with Albert St. Georgie, who was a Nobel Prize winner, um, who defined um, the way muscle worked. At that time, it made me realize that that's what I wanted to do. And I kind of had this vision of being one of the lab rats that worked in the basement of some big institution and learned all kinds of great things. So I decided to go to graduate school, and I spent the next five years getting my doctorate in physiology with a minor in biophysics. When I finished my graduate degree, there were no jobs. Um, and what had happened was there were a lot of people that had gone um, to graduate school to get out of the war, the Vietnam War. Because of the war ending, when I graduated, there was a glut of PhDs who just came onto the market. And as a result of that, there were no real good jobs. And so I thought, you know what, I need to make a, another decision. And I th thought, I'm going to go to medical school. At the end of it, I was trying to decide what kind of a physician I wanted to be. And I settled on orthopedics because I was one of those kids that loved taking things apart, putting them back together and rebuilding things. And I think because of my Italian heritage, I had some carpentry genes um, that were buried in there someplace. Uh, and so that's what I settled on. In 1994, my wife had five people with birthdays in the month of August. So every year we would have a communal birthday party. And they had picked a place called Sleepy Hollow Lake. At the lake, there were pavilions that you could rent. And she rented one um, that would hold 25 plus people. And that was going to be our our August get-together. I was given the job of running the barbecue, so I was outside getting the food ready, and most everybody else was upstairs in the pavilion. And at the beginning of the day, it was beautiful outside. Sun was shining. It was a pleasant temperature, and everything seemed good. At some point, I had decided I should call my mom to check on her because she was not going to be there. By this time, my, my dad had already passed, so uh, my mom was there by herself, and I wanted to check on her. So I, I got somebody to cover the barbecue, and I walked around the front of the building where there was a payphone attached. What I hadn't realized was that a storm cloud had blown up over the lake, and so we're right next to the lake. Um, so I walk over and I'm going to call my mom and I put in the code and the phone and I'm trying to get her on the pay phone and I let it ring five, six, seven times and she didn't pick up. So I thought, all right, she's busy. Um, I'll try her again later. And as I started to take the phone away from my face to hang it up, I heard a huge crack and this big flash of light came out of the phone and it hit me right in the face. 
and just threw me back like a rag doll. And as it threw me back, I had the strangest sensation of moving forward. And, and I remember standing there going, this doesn't make any sense. I know I saw the lightning. I knew I'd been hit. And I knew I'd been thrown backwards. But now I'm standing here and, and nothing's making sense. And I look at the phone and the phone's dangling. And I'm just standing there, just absolutely bewildered. And at that point, I hear my mother-in-law screaming, and she's at the top of the stairs. I'm at the bottom of the stairs. And she starts running down the stairs, headed right at me. And I thought, this can't be good when your mother-in-law is running at you, screaming that something's bad. As she got down in front of me, she was looking off to her left. And, and I thought, this is really strange. And it's like I wasn't even there. And I'm, and I'm like, what the hell? And I turn to go where she's going, and I took about three steps, and I run into myself on the ground. And I'm like, oh, shit, I'm dead. And it was such a shock. I fully expected that when you died, there would be some sort of a anything. Something would happen to tell you, you know, bells, whistles, who knows what. But there would be some sort of a signal that, hey, buddy, you're dead. Um, but there wasn't. It was just a very natural progression of I was in this state, this second, and the next second I was someplace else. I went from being in, in a physical form to being in a spiritual form. There was a lady who was waiting to use the phone. She gets down to start doing CPR. Turns out she's a nurse. And I'm standing there, and I'm trying to call out to anybody who will listen. And I don't see, you know, I can see all of them. I can hear all of them. But nobody can see or hear me. And then it occurred to me that I'm standing here, and I'm thinking exactly the way I normally would. I have complete control of my mind. And I'm thinking in the vernacular in the way that I normally would think. And I'm having these massive racing thoughts are going through my head trying to make sense of this whole thing. But I realized at that moment that whoever I am, I always am. And there's no such thing as death. And, you know, my spirit or whoever I was is eternal. And that was probably the first big thing that realization that came to me as as this whole thing unfolded was that my spirit is here forever so we're essentially two people you know we're in this body which is nothing more than uh, a costume over the top of of who we are always and in our spirit form. And, you know, when I went up to the, to the body and I, and I looked at it and, um, it seemed to be very dispassionate about it. It was like, that's me, but it's not. You know, I'm, I'm me. I'm still who I always was. And that's nothing but an empty shell. And, and that was, that was pretty earth shaking. It was not a frightening experience. It was, you know, it was just very matter-of-factly, this is the way things really are. And then I thought, well, there's no point in standing here because nobody can see me or hear me. And I turned around and I start to walk toward the stairs and I'm going to go up the stairs and check on my family. And I started up the stairs and I got to about the third step and I'm looking down at the ground and... I start to see my legs dissolve. And I thought, well, okay, this is getting really weird. Um, and as I got to the top of the stairs, I had lost all form. I was just a ball of energy. The stairs, when you get to the top of the first level, it goes up another few steps to the left. And I didn't bother with that. I, I had no form. I just went through the wall. And when I came out on the other side of the wall, 
I came out right over the top of my wife, who was sitting, painting children's faces. And I, I remember taking a picture in my head of, of who was there, what kids were there, how the furniture was arranged, and what order the kids were standing in. And that became an important issue later on when we were comparing notes. And I was able to say all of these things that verified the fact that, yeah, I did see it and I was there. I continued going through that room. And when I got out of the room and went through the roof, and that's when things really got interesting, it was like I had suddenly fallen into a river of pure positive energy. There was a bluish white light that this energy emanated from. If you can imagine an energy that's completely composed of love and peace, there were no other emotions, no other senses that I had uh, except that. And it was, it was just earth shaking to feel that much love and peace coming from this source. And it came to me that this must be the God energy. This is what makes everything. And I thought, you know, this is the greatest thing that could ever happen to somebody to, to have this realization and to have this feeling. And that's the only time I've ever experienced anything like that um, and in my whole life. At that point, I realized that I was going someplace. And I started to see a collage of high points and low points in my life. It was just, there wasn't a lot of explanation or, or, or thought. It was just, there's pictures of, of different things in my life. High points, low points, um, trauma, whatever it was. And at that point, I was just kind of settling into flowing in the stream. I didn't know where it was going or where it was taking me, but it was exciting. Um, and uh, it was almost, it was an ecstasy. Um, it was such a wonderful feeling. And then all of a sudden, it's like somebody flipped a switch. Suddenly, I was in pain. And I was back in my body, calling out loud in, in my head um, to whoever would listen that, you know, please don't make me do this. I, yeah, I don't want to go back. And I had three kids and, and a wife, and, and I loved my life. Um, but there was no comparison to what I was experiencing outside my body. I was like, please don't make me do this. I... I was really angry. I wanted to, I wanted to stay where I was because it went from absolute bliss to absolute pain. I mean, where this thing hit me in the face and where it came out my foot was like two hot pokers. But I realized that, you know, it's not my choice. And so the, the lady who was doing CPR had stopped and she was kneeling next to me and it took several minutes before I I was conscious to be able to open my eyes. And when I opened my eyes, everything was really out of focus. And I wanted to say something to thank her. And unfortunately, what came out was, I'm a doctor. It, you know, it, it's okay. <laughs> like, you know, what a stupid thing to say. And so I realized at that point that, okay, you're not thinking very clearly, you know, just shut up and, and just wait this out. You know, of course, everybody starts running over and they call an ambulance and they call the police. And I thought, I don't want to go sit in the emergency room for four to six hours to have somebody tell me I'm alive. So I opted to just have them take me home and I called my cardiologist friends and my neurologist friends and I said you know this happened and they said we'll come right over and went to their offices and 
And everybody said the same thing. It's like, well, you're lucky you're alive. After my near-death experience, I was afraid to say anything to anybody. This was, you know, in the early 90s. And at that time, um, you know, somebody could call the state and say, this guy's kind of loose around the edges. Um, you might want to pull his license because he's saying things that don't make a lot of sense. I kept my mouth shut for the most part. Um, I talked to friends and family um, about it, but, you know, it was, I wasn't going to embarrass myself and, and have people call me a lunatic either. Before the lightning, I was on a road for academic orthopedics. I wanted to publish papers, and I was a, a chairman of a big spine meeting um, every every year, and, you know, I was... I was going down that road, and none of those things seemed to be important anymore. I was really in a, you know, kind of lost. I was beginning to wonder, why did I go through this? Because it wasn't making a whole lot of sense to me. And then all of a sudden, I started to have this insatiable desire to hear classical piano music, which was, that was a big departure for me. Um, there was rock and roll. There really wasn't much of anything else. But now all of a sudden I'm, I'm having this desire to hear the classical piano stuff. And it was so, such a strong feeling that I actually, I drove to Albany because it was the closest place that would have classical piano CDs. I remember when I went in there that this CD of Vladimir Ashkenazi playing his favorite Chopin just jumped off the shelf into my hands. And I thought, okay, this obviously is something I'm supposed to have. And so I, I bought the CD and I started listening to it and I was absolutely captivated. I could not stop listening. Um, and I listened to it all day long. And then very shortly after that, I realized that it was not going to be enough to be able to listen to this music. I needed to learn how to play it. And that was a big problem since I didn't have a piano and I didn't know how to play. So, you know, I was like, okay, well, now what do I do? Well, the very next day, our, one of our babysitters um, came by and said, I'm, I'm moving you know, and I had this old upright piano that I want to I want to keep, but could I store it at your house for a year? And I thought, okay, this is kind of weird. Um, you know, I have this thought yesterday that I need a piano, and suddenly a piano's here. So I started to try to teach myself how to play, and a couple of weeks into it, I have a dream, and in this dream, I'm walking out onto a stage. And on the stage, I see myself, and I'm playing in a concert hall, and I'm playing music on a piano. And as I'm walking toward myself, I come to the realization that this is not somebody else's music. This is mine. The music had a loud ending, and it woke me up out of a sound sleep. And I remember sitting up on the edge of the bed, and I looked at the time. It was 3.15 in the morning. And I thought, well, let me go out to this piano. And I started trying to plunk out different notes of, of things that I heard. But I had no idea how to write music, and I had no idea how to play it either. Um, so I said, the hell with this, and I went back to bed. But from that moment on, whenever I went to the piano, the music from the dream would start to play. And it would play all the time. And, and if I ignored it, it would start to play when I didn't want it to. I was trying to concentrate on surgery. I was trying to do something else. It was that, that powerful inside of me that, you know, it was like, okay, this is much more than I understand that it is. And the next day I went out. And I had to find a program to teach how to 
write music. And there was a program called Sibelius, which is essentially writing music for dummies. And I was able to take that that program and would start to write the music from the dream. And I spent the next seven months, every single free minute I had, and I really went off the deep end with the music. I, I literally got up at 4.30, and I would practice till 6.30 when I had to go to work. And then I would, I would do my 12 or 14 hours. And when I came home, it was time to put kids to bed. And then as soon as they were in bed, I was back at the piano, and I was, I was there till 12, 1 o'clock. I was absolutely possessed by the music and the piano, and nothing else was important. One thing that I have found with the music is that it takes me about as close to that feeling, that euphoria of being on the other side, as I can get. It's almost like there's a, a connection that I, I can access. It's a frequency that I'm able to tune into. And, you know, in reading about other composers, um, you know, the great composers all said the same thing. Um, Mozart was most prolific about it. And he said, you know, the music would come to me in finished form. And all I did was write it down. And, you know, lots of people have speculated that our brain is nothing more than a receiver. There's no way in the world it could house all the information that we have access to. There's some off-site place that we are able to communicate with. Life exists after death. We're in this form for a certain period of time, and then we leave this form and we become something else. So there's, it's just a continuum uh, of existence. You keep going through this, um, this process. You reincarnate as something else or someone else. Your spirit continues, and you go through an evolution of, of learning and phases of, of healing and understanding of, of what you experienced in this present life and what you're going to work on in the next one. I mean, that's what we're here for. We're here to learn and to experience and to evolve spiritually into a higher being than what we are now. The way I look at it is everybody can go back to the source, but you have to earn your way back. And you do that by going through proving grounds, if you will. Um, you experientially develop. You know, there's two polarities. There's positive and negative. Um, and moving along a positive polarity is service to others as opposed to the negative, which is service to self. And if, if you can think along a line of service to others in your daily life, then that gives you a, a more of an advantage to, to grow spiritually and ultimately, find your way home. Rejoin with the source from whence everything came. This was the greatest thing that I've ever experienced in my life. I was given an opportunity to, to see what happens after death. Death is not to be feared. It's just a changing form. You still exist as whoever you are and always will be. Before the lightning experience, I was very grounded in science. 
in terms of, you know, what is reality? And now I completely understand that there's much more um, to our existence than we have any idea of. If everybody could experience that before they die, they would have a whole different perspective on life and and what we're doing here, and it would change everything.